We'll take it away, Mark. All righty. So uh, basically, thank you guys for coming out. Uh, we all know what it's like to build a real estate team. It's not as easy as it looks. Uh, it's not social media and it's definitely not selling Sunset or any of those other dumb TV shows. It's a pain in the butt, but if you can get the systems in place, it definitely does help out a ton. And even at my level of like what I did last year, 500 million, trust me, I still don't have it perfect. There's better ways of doing business. Uh, I learned from everyone as much as you guys could possibly learn from me. So it's, it's really just about this kind of making sure that we share. And that's why we just love doing this kind of stuff. I do about a free seminar once a month. Um, Joe is someone who I like to partner with. He coaches our team, coaches me. So just someone great there. Uh, but everything about it, it's like, there has to be a simpler way to do things. And I think we can learn from each other. The problem uh, is that, you know, it's, it's confusing, challenging and complex, meaning it's, you can't really figure it all out at once. Um, I always try to say, it's like, why reinvent the wheel when you can help each other and go off of this? So understanding the dynamics of the systems can be difficult. You know, what kind of systems you need going back to like CRM, do you use follow-up boss? Do you see your interactive? Are you using Ylopo? All that stuff, uh, you know, knowing when you do have it set up, is it the right stuff? Checking that in and then making sure that you're able to keep these things simple and organized so it's easy for people to understand. And, you know, when you bring people on is, do you have a system for onboarding? That's all important and all the different things that you need to get in order. So our promise, um, basically clarity, just getting through all the systems and how you can start capturing them, consistency, the specific time frame, um, you know, framework to follow and how to stay consistent, and then collaboration, how you can collaborate with us to begin systemizing. I do calls weekly. If you're not part of a mastermind, definitely start considering that. Don't think that a one-hour seminar, you're never going to be able to implement everything. Also, don't join too many uh, masterminds. You know, you got to spread yourself out. Don't spread yourself too thin. Always learn from others. Anytime I go to a conference or a meeting, I always say, write down three things that you want to implement. So I like if you can figure three things out, write those three and how you're going to implement them and when you're going to have them done by, that's the best way to do it. And I want to touch base on something you said, um, because I, I think in the real estate industry, you mentioned, right, don't join every mastermind. I think there's so much content in our industry being thrown at us in, in so many different ways. And I think one thing that, you know, Mark and I always try to focus on is how do we simplify everything from start to finish? And so when we talk about what well, the, the problems we saw and the, the complexity and the challenge of creating systems, it's not just the system of technology, it's the system of what processes to follow, what to implement before, what to implement after. How do we make things simple to where it's not up to you to do it because it's so complex, but it's so simple to where you can delegate it and you can start growing and scaling. So when I was coming up with, you know, what I wanted to get out of it, and we were, I was talking to Mark and figuring out what he wanted to kind of share, you know, these were the things that came to mind. We wanted to create clarity for you. We wanted to demystify what systems were, what they can do, what they were meant for. We wanted to help you create consistency in your business because consistency creates predictability. And the more we can do that for our business, the more we can help you do that with your business, the easier it's going to be to kind of take control of what your growth looks like. And then collaboration. So we're going to spend the next 60 minutes giving as much detail as we can. And then if there's more you want to learn or if there's more ways you want to get involved, we'll offer a way at the end or a couple of ways that you can take advantage of that. I love that idea when you talk about that, Joe, is people ask me, oh, what podcast do you listen to? What books are you reading? I'm like, I'm not reading too many podcasts or implementing or going after too many books. I'm networking with you guys, learning from you because you guys are in the, in the weeds doing exactly what I want to do. And then I'm going back home and implementing. If I sit there and listen to podcasts all day, when do I have time to actually do anything? Uh, so this gives last year in San Diego, I did 800 plus uh, units all over the country. We did 1,006 homes. So we're the first team to sell over 500 in San Diego County. And we did over 500 million. Um, I've got the most Zillow reviews. I'll share some secrets on how to get reviews online, whether it's Google, Zillow, or however you want to go about it, Yelp. There's a bunch of different secrets that you can do. And I think second place for San Diego on Zillow is maybe like 600 reviews or something or 700 reviews. We're pretty far ahead. So, and those reviews matter. We get a ton of free leads from that. And so Mark, one thing on here is your obsession with traveling. Uh, where's the next country you're going? 
I had to edit it early, like five minutes before the thing. I read it and it said 72 countries, but I went to three countries not too long ago. So I added it. Uh, I'm going to Israel and I'm going to Jordan in, uh, and I'm going to a few other places. I'm going to Denmark again this year. I try to go to a, like, like at least 10 countries a year. <laughs> that is kind of funny. So I did sell moped or I did sell homes on a moped. So I'd like go around the corner park and fix my hair. So this goes back to the idea of like, there's no excuses. You've got it a lot better than most people in it. And if you have people on your team, if they keep coming up with excuses of why they're not performing or not why they're not producing, it's bullshit. Fire them. Uh, if I can sell homes on a moped, I got a girl that's pregnant and has a kid that's maybe a year and a half. And she's got two new listings and she's a brand new agent. So I freaking put the baby on the hip and go on the appointment. She's like, I'm going to make this work. So if you've got people that are, are doing that, you've got the wrong people. Here are the stats I talked about. So last year I had 46 active agents, 500 plus million, 800 transactions and six years. Plus I've had my team for five years. And I, I think that's so critical to note the six year in the business um, because that's something we never see in real estate to have six years in the business to have this kind of growth. And so I think hopefully we'll be able to kind of dive into that a little bit in terms of, you know, what's worked for you. And I know that's, that's our intention. So Mark, when you say 500 million, 800 transactions, 46 active agents, six years in the business, what what's like your main focus to make sure that you are able to grow at this pace? Implement. Do you think my stuff's perfect? Absolutely not. By the way, I make sure there's nothing inappropriate on my desk, but I have freaking got crap all over. My stuff is not perfect. There's like soundproofing falling from the ceiling up there. So it looks decent, but guys, nothing will ever, ever be perfect. So just make it work. Go with it. Don't be scared to do changes. When you do make changes with your team, make sure it's rolled out properly. And when you do it, make sure they understand and they're bought in. If you just change stuff on people all the time, it's going to freak them out. Do you think I've had to change stuff quite frequently with this? Of course. So I had to come up with methods of how to do it. And I think just implementing, but also getting your team on board to make sure that they got the buy-in. And so I'll share, you know, a little bit about who I am and how this started. So before real estate, I was in corporate America. After corporate America, started selling, you know, just like you guys. And I was in San Diego. From there, I ended up moving up in another company and ended up taking over a few real estate brokerages as a team leader. From there, um, it wasn't exactly what, what I wanted to do. It wasn't exactly my focus, my intention, my obsession, I call it. Um, so then I took a risk, took an opportunity and started coaching. Um, and it, it started with a few and then it just kind of blew up. And when I got into coaching, it was actually to do something that was a, a little different. And so it was always a focus to create my own methodology. And what I noticed was everything looked the same, felt the same. I was hearing the same things, but the results weren't really changing. We had an industry that was 90% failure rate over five years. It was getting tougher and tougher to scale, depending on the markets, businesses were fluctuating. And so I created something called the four S's, which was system, strategy, structure, and support. And that was my intention to create a good experience and good results. And so luckily and fortunately, I'm able to work with a lot of high performers now. Um, average volume, you know, is, is pretty well. And at the bottom, you see a proven methodology. Now it's kind of typed like it was a book. I'm not an author. This isn't a book. Um, but I did italicize it because it has been an obsession of mine. The one thing I focus on across the board is doubling a business every year. No matter what position, that's always been my focus. To give you an idea what that looks like, these are some of the people I get an opportunity to work with. Um, and Mark is well aware of you know, a good amount of these because they're friends with him too. Um, but if you look at you know, Chad in Texas, Houston, Texas, 40 million last year, he's on pace for 80 this year. Uh, Justin, one of my very first clients last year, 20 million on pace for 60. Rima just did a training with her and she's exploding like crazy. She's on pace. She says 150 million or we were, it's right around 125 conservative, but we're still going to shoot for 150. Um, and then you see Will, Kevin just confirmed the other day. Kara is always my co-host for everything. Mark, his numbers are okay. He's, he's doing okay in the industry. 
Um, and, and it's became this obsession of how do you create consistency across the board to double a business? How do you create a methodology that actually works, that actually can get implemented, executed to double? And so you see Mark's numbers right here and, and they're astounding. And he follows a lot of the same principles or methodologies that I focus on and I teach. And, you know, I'm excited of what we're going to be able to implement into that business because, and I just want to confirm this, Mark, at a billion in volume, you'll be the first team in San Diego history to do a billion in one year, right? Yes. Yeah. The most is right around 500 million. Which you did this year. Yeah. Nice. Um, There's a couple so, other teams that do a luxury, but they just don't have the, the amount of agents. And so yeah. what you see here is, is this obsession of mine. And so I'll kind of go through little things here and there of, you know, what I recommend or what you can change or what you can adopt. Uh, but for the most part, you see a record of success with Mark Addison, and that's going to be our intention today. And so here's what this looks like. Here's what we're going to cover. Number one, the importance of systemizing and how to differentiate just between a system and a process. We're going to take it back to basics. Number two is what we're all here for, and that's the seven critical systems of a $100 million business. So what's worked for Mark to scale quickly? I believe, you know, he had a team for three years before they hit around $100 million. And then how to efficiently document SOPs. We've all heard SOPs, which are standard operating procedures. So what does that mean? How do we demystify it? And how can you take control of the structure and operations of your business with SOPs? And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And so this slide was, you know, a little different. Um, but what I want to share is I'm going to take it back to basics. So systems, if we just look at the easiest way to understand systems and probably one of my favorite ways, it's actually the human body. The human body is made up of so many systems and we can all relate because we all have the same ones. If only real estate were that easy to where we can just take someone else's that easily. Um, but when you look at the human body, everything is connected to each other. Okay. And that's the idea of systems. It's the collaboration, the fact that everything's talking to each other, that when one thing goes wrong, sadly, something else goes wrong. Your business is reflected the same way. Your business and your personal life or your business and your body are very similar. And so as you're thinking about systems and as we go over different things, I want you to think about in a sense of a human body. I want you to think about everything that we're going to talk about and everything you look at in your business is interconnected. And so the idea is not just to grab some nugget, but to understand that if everything's connected, how do I change one thing, which will change another, which will change another, and then how do I bring organization with it? And so taking this kind of 30,000 foot view, your business, these are the main systems. If, if we can simplify as much as we can, it's going to be marketing, sales, and operations. Those are the three core pillars of your business, and they all have systems. They all have a way to run them. They all have something interconnected that kind of bring everything together to give you the results that you want. And so what's the difference between a system and a process? A system is the overall thing. I want you to think about a system encompassing multiple different things. It's tech, it's automation, it's checklists, it's processes. The process is just a integral part of a system. So think of a system as everything and think of a process as one action in it. An easy way to think about that is transaction management. Transaction management is a system. It's all done so that you can get a closing, so that they can close on their home. That's the system you're running. Now, transaction management has a lot of different things inside and a lot of different things you're doing to get that end result. Those are the specific processes. So I just wanna differentiate that. The system and the process, they're completely different things. And when you look at a system, it entails all these different things, okay? There's checklists, there's templates, there's tools, there's videos, automation, workflows, okay? And the only reason why I'm saying this is because I, I often see that, you know, it, it can be confusing and there's a lot of things happening, but I want you to just understand that a system is just incorporating everything to get you a specific result. And everything we're doing is to be part of a system that runs itself. That's the end goal. All right, Mark. All right, seven critical systems. So your planning system, so strategic planning, understanding your meetings. We're gonna talk about you know how you're having your meetings, how often you should have them. I schedule all of my meetings out for the entire year. Quarterly, we do all of our events. We make sure we have everything on the calendar and 
Easiest way to do it, there's a little trick. Make sure your team is using Gmail, have a team email for that. So when you add new agents into it, all you have to do is if the calendar invite is out to team at Porchlight SoCal, anyone who's part of that group on Gmail, they're gonna get the new calendar invites. So that way they have absolutely everything in there. Um, that's a good way. So make sure that if you have people come on mid year, you don't have to make sure you send them all the calendar invites. You can do the entire year's planning at your end of year business planning. Uh, we can talk about each planning meeting uh, serves kind of different purpose. So you don't need to follow, like you do need to follow the st structure, but the people aren't going to be the same that are there. So we can go into the, how I do each one on the meetings. Um, I do monthly team meetings. I do quarterly team meetings. At the eight quarterly team meetings, we make sure we highlight agent of the quarter, rookie of the quarter, top converter for Veterans United, top converter for Zillow Flex, top converter for uh, Realtor.com. We make sure we, we praise them on each one of those quarterly meetings. We do weekly executive meetings every week, Monday, 9 a.m. We jump into a room completely separate from our team, no distractions for two hours. Uh, we start off kind of big wins, anything that's going on in your life, anything that's going on in business, each one of us shares with our executive team. And then we do quarterly executive meetings to kind of see bigger picture. Uh, if you guys know the idea of like picking out your rocks, each person on your executive team should have three rocks. And then they should be focused on doing those little things that turn into the big changes that happen every quarter. Uh, and we focus on those at the quarter, but we kind of talk about them every week. So if they need support or how they're going with it, so that the end of the quarter doesn't come up, which we're almost there for quarter one and say, oh shit, I didn't do one of my, my rocks. We're always checking in on those. Our monthly team meetings, um, we go over the issues list. We have an open discussion. We do this on a different level though. So anyone who's, we cut our agents into different levels, um, brand new agents. I'm not going to really go with them with the issues list. We kind of help them through the process when they're brand new, but we want to go to the bigger agents that have been on the team for a while and say like, Hey, how can we make your life even better? Um, sales goals, always important. Every single time I send out an all company email, I actually include our current sales in the bottom. So that the agents are constantly knowing what's going on. Plus, in my office, if you've ever been here, we have uh, big screens all up around the office and there's slideshows happening where it shows all the stats. So people know where we're at all the time. Training, we always pick a different training topic um, depending on level. Obviously, I'm not going to talk about you know something super advanced to a brand new agent and also vice versa. Uh, awards that we go over. And then at the end, whatever we covered in the training, I have a quiz ready to hand out. So I'll create all my quizzes in Cognito. Cognito is like 10 bucks a month. It's like a fancy Google Forms. You can create Google Forms as well. But say you're training on 1031 exchanges, my agents know at the end of the meeting, there's gonna be a 1031 quiz. It's just like private Catholic school that I got had to go through my entire life. So it's payback to them. Uh, so, you know, pop quiz at the end, they have to fill out everything. And in order to like basically progress through my team, they got to know all this stuff. If you can make 200, 300, $400,000, in real estate, there's a girl on my team that made 750,000 last year take home. Um, she only made like 200 grand after taxes in California. But besides that, she made 750 before tax. Uh, and that shit's because she knows her stuff. And I want to make sure my agents are always knowing. And it's through education with the training. And it's not just that because have you ever had people look at you and they're like not paying attention or they're on their phone. There's no phones in my meeting. There's no crosstalk. It is you talk, I fire you. If you don't raise your hand, you're fired. So we go and make sure that everything is ran exactly how, and it's it's a respectful environment. We know how it works and it's not a bullshit time. It's like, let's get stuff done. So my quarterly exec meetings, definitely go over the issues list, um, see what's happening. You know, if, if agents are talking or we hear things in the back, you know, what we need to change, plan team events. So we go and make sure if I'm out of town, who's covering it and what events we have going on. We have a charity squad. So we do this through Cognito form as well. We have anyone who wants you to sponsor their kid's baseball team or someone on your team wants uh, to do this charity. Fantastic. Fill out this form, which says, what's the charity name? What is the support? When are the dates? When do we have to have a decision by? That email gets forwarded to all the people on the charity team. So we have four agents on our charity squad. They're all volunteers. And then we go through and look and see which ones we want to pick for the next three months. We have a mentor program. Any agent that has sold over 12 homes that has closed 12, I'm sorry, closed 12 deals and at least a listing has had zero complaints from other agents, basically is, you know, the porch light way. We have them become mentors and they mentor the new agents. Um, I can talk about the splits on that, but basically we want to focus like who's available for more mentees, 
who's maxed out, what's the feedback like for the mentors. We have the mentees and the mentors review each other every 30 days. So it's open communication. We do that through Cognito Forms as well. So it's an automatic email that sends out. Say I partnered Joe with a mentee. The mentee and the mentor will both get an email every 30 days saying, hey, review your partner. Any issues? What do you like? What don't you like? Constructive feedback. And then we get that feedback and we take it and we basically make sure that things are going okay. And then we walk away each quarter with three to-dos. Don't think you have to do too much, but those are the three big rocks. Say we're uh, launching an insurance company. That was mine. Uh, or say we're you know, launching a disclosure company, which another one I did, uh, escrow title, those kind of things. Those would be like the big to-dos for the quarter. So yes, I did launch, I think two companies this quarter, and but that's how my mind works is just kind of run with it. But whatever's big for you, have that be your three big takeaways. And so sales take, meetings. I'm gonna ahead. jump into this one. I'll take this one. Perfect. So for, for those of you that are, are seeing Mark's business and the size and the scale, Usually when a team is much larger, and we're talking about teams right now because of planning, when a team's much larger, you would typically separate your leadership and operations and your sales team because they're usually two different focuses. Now, when you're first starting a team or if you have a smaller team, the easiest way to get started in terms of planning is to have a weekly sales meeting, at least from my perspective. And so the weekly sales meeting is kind of like the bookends. It's the thing that says, here's the start and here's the finish. And then what can you accomplish in between? Now, an easy format you can take is this one right here. So if you look at a weekly sales meeting, it's going to be the same day and time every week. It's going to act as a bookend. You would start with personal or business celebrations. So give anyone an opportunity to share their celebrations or wins. The second part is to go over any team headlines or updates. So what that means is anything that you know, is very positive that happens. So maybe you got a new member on the team. Maybe there's a new partnership. Maybe you made new investments. Maybe you're Mark. You bought like five houses in a six day time frame. Whatever those <laughs> four whatever, homes. Four homes. So whatever that that may be, right? The team headlines or updates is your opportunity to get them more connected to what you're doing with the team. Now the third part is the productivity review or what's called a scorecard. Now, bigger teams will likely use a service or a company called Sisu. Um, but if you're smaller, there's really no need to invest with that. So what you would do is you would just start early on and just go over some core metrics that are important to you. Mark, you know, became famous for something called a 100 point day. And so what that was, it's a daily checklist that agents can, you know, add up their points. And once they hit 100 points, they're done with the day. Now it is easier to use a service like Sisu because everything can go on a dashboard. But until then, the idea is to just focus on what can you control in your business and what are your agents doing and how can you set performance metrics on it? The fourth part is training, deep dive, or issues. The reason why I give opportunity is because you can either focus on training in your meetings. That'll get someone to come. They'll see the importance. You can focus on a deep dive, meaning something happened and you want to dig in a little deeper. Or maybe there's issues that come up and you want to discuss that. This is the time where you can connect with the team on a deeper level and make sure you're all moving forward in the same direction. The fifth part is planning and preparation. So we always review what happened before, and then we always want to plan and strategize what the next week looks like. And so this is your opportunity to make sure that your team or your agents or maybe just your assistant has everything they need to be successful in whatever you want to accomplish this next week. If you're going on a certain amount of listing appointments and you don't feel prepared, what can you do? What can they do to support you in terms of getting everything ready? And the last part, and one of my favorite, uh, is actually gratitude. And I learned this from, from a close friend, and that is just ending every meeting with what are you most grateful for right now? And so what it does is it gives a positive spin on everything you're doing, and it gives a last minute touch to where you leave everything out on the table and everything is good moving forward. And they'll start to think of creative things. They'll give you one word, two words, but Essentially, it's just, what are you grateful for at this moment? Lead generation system. So honestly, this is probably my favorite thing. Leads are all about relationships. Whether you have past clients or you're working with Zillow or you're working with Realtor.com, build those relationships and treat them like gold. Because honestly, guys, especially the vendor partners, um, we call them whales or we call them, you know, like basically our channel partners. 50% of sales in America, I believe next year or the year after, 
or going to, they're going to come from a referral partner. They're going to come from another agent in another market. They're going to come from relocation company. They're going to come from Zillow Flex charging you a 35% referral fee. That's going to happen. It already does. And it's basically one of my core businesses of how I'm able to basically scale so fast is because I have these relationships with multiple partners. So think about who you can align yourself with, because if you go and sign up on these websites and say, hey, I want to be part of Zillow Flex, they're going to say they're not going to respond to you. So unless you got the connections and how you can get in, you're not going to be able to get there. I honestly stalked a lot of people on social media and I started commenting on their stuff every single week. And that's how I got into Zillow Flex. I had the numbers to prove I could convert, but they weren't looking at me because they had so many people coming to them that they were just like picking who they wanted to have for the next partner for Zillow Flex. Um, most agents, if you have agents on your team that are interviewing and they say, well, you know, oh, the split or the referral fee or this, I always explain leads like this in terms of building your home. So I want to help you build a solid foundation, which may have a lot of referral fees and splits with the team. But when those leads refer you business, you're not going to owe a referral fee to Zillow or HomeLite or whomever else. That's the walls to your home for real estate. Then when those past clients, those Zillow Flex leads that closed, you know, two, three years ago, when they call you to sell, that's the roof to your business and you don't owe a referral fee again. So make sure that you explain to these agents, if anyone says, well, what's your splits during an interview? You say, well, how much do you want to net? That is my first objection handler. How, what are your splits? Well, how much do you want to net? Oh, I would love to net about $100,000. Perfect. Great news is here are 10 people last year that in their first year in the business on my team did more than that. And I'll go through on CSU, you know, how they're talking about how we track everything. And I'll show them examples. I steer the conver conversation away from splits. We go over splits when we do the contract and we do an example. Always be transparent, but make sure they understand the value of these leads and that it's not about the split. It's about how much you want to make. Uh, so always steer that conversation. Paid lead opportunities. You've got your you know, initial investment, your realtor.coms, you have your Zillow's, you have Zillow Premier, which is paid. Zillow Flex is referral. So there is a difference on those. Also, realtor.com has OpCity. There's a couple of different ones that they have as well. So depending on your market and you have top tier leads, which are Zillow Flex, realtor.com. Then you got your middle tier, which may be your home lights or your fast experts. And these do vary between each marketplace. I do know some people that are on uh, home light elite and they crush it. So that would be like a top tier lead. Um, we have bottom tier, which is like your Facebook pay-per-click, your Instagram ads. What I mean by top tier, middle tier and bottom tier, it should be about your conversion rate. So if you give an agent top tier leads, they should be able to convert much easier than giving them a bottom tier. I don't give my agents any bottom tier leads. It works in some markets. If you're in a market, you know, big city, bottom tier leads don't work. They do if you've got automation and things set up, but do not expect your agents to convert more than 1% or maybe a little bit more than that. On the top tier leads, you can convert anywhere from five to 10%. So understand what you're giving your agents. If you give your agent 20 Facebook leads and they don't convert anything, no shit. They converted a 1%. No wonder why they haven't closed anything. You haven't given them enough leads. Problem is if you give your agent 100 Facebook leads, it's too much to call. 100 new Facebook leads every month, 100 this month, 100 next month. Well, now they have 200. They're following up with the last ones. And if they converted a 12 to 18 months ratio, now you got to follow up with almost 1,800 leads. <laughs> Obviously, there's going to be ones that are going to fall off, but you have 1,500 leads you'd have to call through every single month. That'd be impossible to do. So every market's different. I'm talking about San Diego specific or any of the big markets I go to, but bottom tier leads, I'd stay clear away from unless you have an automation system, meaning the agent basically only picks up leads that have raised their hand. So if you use YLOPO or Hatch or one of those systems, that's what you're going to go after. Um, and you can do a ton with Facebook and PPC on that. Past client campaigns. Every single past client gets these different things. So letter of the heart, have your agents write letters from the heart. Every single month, do like a letter of the heart party where they put together just one letter, have a little photo on it, print it and send it to all their past clients. We do quarterly events. So we do happy hours. That's where we get our reviews. We do quarterly calls to our past clients. Great way is just call them, invite them to your happy hour. They know you're still in the business. Hey, oh, I sold this house. Oh, I sold this house in your neighborhood. If you represented them on the buy side, make sure you let your, your clients know that you also list homes. There's this idea that there's buyer's agents and listing agents and teams don't cross or agents don't cross. 
make sure you convey that to your clients. Hey, when you're ready to list your house in two, four, six, eight, whatever many years, you're going to call me, right? I'll say that at closing. So they know there's no confusion that I list houses. Also, HomeBot. If you're not partnered with the lender already, get a lender partnership with this and update every single one of your past clients when you close, have them added to HomeBot. They'll get an email every single month and it'll give them the home valuation. Lead conversion systems. So the, person of, uh, the purpose of a lead conversion is to turn a portion of your incoming leads to appointments with emphasis on training, timing, and technology. So use systems that work. Like I said, if you use Follow Up Boss, Sierra, whatever you're using, totally fine. Everyone on your team has to use the same CRM. You can't have someone Follow Up Boss. You can't have someone KV Core. You've got to have everyone on one because it's got to be consistent. If you're transferring leads between each other, Obviously, if you got like a badass agent that's used KV Core or Follow Up Boss or Boomtown and they don't want to switch and you just let them be and they're kind of on their own because maybe they just have past clients, don't make them switch. Thankfully, on my team, every single person uses Follow Up Boss. It's not an option. But if I had that one person who was resistant to it and they're kicking butt and they didn't use any of my leads, I kind of would help them out. You know, you got to do things for certain agents. So make sure that you got these, these systems in place because if you're not using something that you know how that works, copy people like me. I use follow up boss and Y Lopo copy me. I've got friends that are in my network that use hatch and uh, Sierra interactive copy them. If that's your cup of tea. So go with what works for your business. Online lead management. My agents will get max 20 leads of top tier. So remember those Zillow flex realtor.com. I'm not handing them 20 PPC leads but they get max 20 leads a month. Uh, and then each agent can have a hundred active leads in their name per month to sign up for lead shifts. So if they wanna be part of a group, the, the virtual assistant goes in and checks who has you know, Zillow, realtor.com, any other ones that are my leads, if they have more than a hundred, we're gonna say, hey, we're pausing you for the time being until you clean this up because we know you're too busy. And they're like, oh no, I'm good. Well then why isn't every single one you know, set up on a search? Why isn't every single one have a task? Make your agents do this kind of stuff to follow up with them. And if you give them too many leads, too many leads is actually a bad thing. Lead pawns, we divide all the leads into pawns. We also started doing things called squads. As you get bigger, make sure you have mentors in place and make sure you have squad leaders in place to take charge. I would even have squads. If your team starts getting 10 agents, 15 agents, have a squad leader for each five people and then build those squads up. So then you've got to talk to maybe two or three people but then those squad leaders are in charge of helping out those other people. So the way we do squads, the difference between mentorship and a squad is that the squad leader is in charge of one type of lead source. We were giving our agents Zillow Flex, Realtor.com, Veterans United, and one agent could get all those. They were having to update different portals depending on which lead they got. It was just a kind of a chaotic mess. We divided it up and said, hey, look, you're on Zillow Flex, you're on Realtor.com, you're on Veterans United. There's a couple that cross depending on the level you're at at my company. So if you're selling a crap ton of homes, we'll let them have multiple different in, you know, lead sources because if they're freaking killing it and keeping in touch with them, why not? But the newbies we found, do not give them too many different types of lead sources. Keep them on one. If they prove themselves and sell X number of homes in your market, maybe give them two different lead sources. I would rather give more of one type of lead source than go and give someone someone else. For us, ours is pickup rate on Zillow Flex. We've got a great agent. He's like, Mark, I want to get on Realtor.com as well. And I said, man, you know, the only thing is I checked up your pickup rate for Zillow Flex and you're only at 33%. The benchmark is 50%. You're not there. I don't want to give you more leads because you're obviously overwhelmed. I made it more about him versus me saying, I don't want to give him more leads. I say, hey, you know what? Get your lead pickup rate over 50% on that Zillow Flex. Then we'll talk. But always track those metrics. If you're not tracking stuff, you can't go and do these kind of conversations. Um, everything we do, we do retargeting and custom audiences through YLOPO. And then we also take people, if we have a whole bunch of VA buyers, so if you're in a VA market, do VA seminars, have them monthly, take your list of VA clients, throw them into Facebook, do a custom audience, do a like audience, and then start pushing out ads to them. Offer free food and beer and do an hour and a half seminar in your office every single month. You'll crush it with it. If you're not in a market with VA, do something called a Streamline Investor Loan Seminar. Uh, it's Streamline Investor Loan. I own the lending company. They can do as many of these loans as they want. An investor only has to put 20% down. They have to have a 640 credit score and they do not have to have any 
any income statements. They don't have to have any W-2s. So it's a lot of entrepreneurs and business people, if they're not claiming taxes, they can qualify for these loans. Do a freaking, do a little uh, presentation on it. Go in, find people that own two or more homes that live in your area, that have a primary in your area. You can get all that information from title and then do a target custom audience towards them and do a webinar or do a in-person, uh, you know, every single month, do a like investor group, put it on meetup, all that stuff. That's how you're going to get the freaking conversion for those big, big clients. So Mark, quick question. So there's probably a couple of people here who are looking at what you're saying and they're thinking that's where I want to get to. And right now I'm here. At what point do you say someone should start investing into online leads? Uh, if you are a person that wants to build a team and you only have past clients that are yours in your sphere of influence, you're going to need online leads or something else to feed your new agents. So if you're building a team, you're going to need online leads. Um, you know, that past client thing, you can pass people off. You know, if it's you and one other agent, that's fine. But if you are you and five other agents, it's not going to be enough to pass off. Lead ponds, uh, we chop everything up. So we get all this data. We have expired in FISBO into a pond. So we'll have people assign certain ponds, just like how I said, those squad leaders. Our new agents are calling through this stuff. Uh, new leads, depending on what it is, it comes into a pond. If it is a realtor.com or Zillow Flex or Veterans United, those go to specific ponds where only certain people have access to those. So we make sure the squad leader sets up lead shifts. They're in charge of that pond. So when a Zillow Flex lead comes in, it only rings certain people that have been turned on that day. Make it very specific of where your leads are going. Um, and then money pond is kind of anything that's an overflow. If any agent doesn't want something, because remember I said they can only have 100, they've got to dump it into the money pond. We give the money pond to new agents on the team. We're constantly hearing stories of people getting stuff out. Uh, an agent on our team yesterday came up to me. He's a new agent. He's been on a team about a month. He said, hey, Mark, just got a listing appointment. I was like, oh man, where'd you find it? He was like, oh, the money pond. I was like, hey, man, what type of lead was it? He was like, oh, it was a Zillow lead. And I was like, Zillow Flex or Zillow? And he goes, Zillow. So this is when we, before Flex came out, I said, what year's on there? He said, 2015. <laughs> I was like, so you just converted a listing appointment from 2015 lead. Damn, that's good ROI. So that lead would have never been called if we just left it somewhere. Give your agents these new leads. Uh, I'm sorry, these pawns of old leads because they will call through them. Client experience system. So on this here, uh, you have an opportunity with each and every prospect to make sure your brand is like solid. How are you gonna make sure it is when you get to be big? Reviews, events, client check-ins, have a concierge call them. Hey, congratulations on going pending with Josh. You know, he's a fantastic agent. Want to make sure how the process went for you when you're looking for the home. Oh, you know, it was great. Oh yeah, we put in a lot of offers. Yeah, you know, the market's tough right now. Um, congrats on getting one accepted. The next steps are home inspection, insurance, et cetera. We have a concierge person that does that. So it's a check-in. We also send them a referral or I'm sorry, a review link where they can go and review the agent. We have the agents fill out a closing form at the very end. And it says like, hey, what gift do you want for your client? Which, so this form is through Cognito. Shocker, I use Cognito a ton. And it says, what kind of gift do you want your client? And we have four different options for them. And then they don't have to go out and think. They can just have it automated. And then that option, say they select, hey, I want a watercolor painting of the house, which is freaking really cool watercolor painting that one of our past clients do. They put in the address, they hit that. That email automatically sends to our closing department and it sends to the person who's the artist who paints it. So the artist will get an email, go out there and start painting it immediately and then charge the agent on the credit card they have on file already from that person. So it's automated. It makes it really streamlined. And then use that technology so the agents don't have to do it. And then you don't have to have an employee that manages it because it's all through Cognito Forms. And so we don't have to go through this part, but as you could see, so this is especially for the audience and Mark didn't know I was going to put this in there, but I thought it was immense value. Um, this is something that we gave as part of a, a paid program we did, but you can see everything is laid out. So there's no second guessing. Everything is predictable. Everything follows a process. There's actually 10 steps. There's an, another one, but you can see the structure that he follows right here. Now, if you think about your own and you think about the way you're training an agent or you as an agent, are you training in a way that they can see visually how everything is connected? And the reason why I ask that is, 
are you teaching a system or are you just teaching it verbally what you've done? The hard part about that is it's hard for them to take everything and to get all the details when it's not visually laid out. So you can see Mark's here, you can see kind of his buy side operations roadmap, and then you can also see the end of it. And then Mark, anything you want to touch on this space? I wanted to give this part to the audience to kind of, they can see. Can I use this to train my team? Thanks for making this. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. So guys, we have a roadmap that every single agent does. So if they say, hey, I'm at inspections, I know that we have all the disclosures and that they've reviewed them with the buyer. We know at that point, then they email the transaction coordinator and this is what happens next. I can look at all my 100 pending right now and see where they're at on which date. And I can almost guarantee where what we've received and where it's at and who's in charge of it. We use monday.com as well. That's using technology. Cognito Forms automates with monday.com, which automates with Skyslope. It's amazing. All of it connected to follow-up boss. So it moves things in follow-up boss to pending automatically. And then that talks to CSU. Uh, pretty freaking sweet. But yeah, we can jump to the next slide just based on time too. You can screenshot it. Uh, team growth, guys. Biggest way to think about it is that you want to make sure your operations are in order, hire the right people. Then you got your core. So if you got a transaction coordinator or admin, that should be your first hire. After that, you got to think, are you spread too thin because you're still selling? Do you need a sales manager? Typically, when you're new, you need to be the sales manager because people join the team because of you. I would hire an operations manager before I'd hire a sales manager because operations, if you're a good agent, you're usually pretty messy. Remember my desk? I'm probably a solid agent because I got shit all over. My agents here, the best agents have like orange peels underneath their desk and popcorn sitting on there from like three weeks ago. I'm like, clean your shit up. But that means they're a good agent. Um, hire someone operations that can come in and fine tune stuff. As for agents, so on the next slide, we can talk about where we get our agents. Social media. My agents are recruiting agents for my team. How did I get that to happen? Because there's an incentive with my company that they get rev share and they get stock and they get to be their mentor. Make an incentive. If you're not at EXP, uh, make an incentive. Whatever your company offers, if you're at Compass, that's amazing. If you're at KW, that's amazing. You better pay your agents to recruit and you better show them, dude, Randy, that is the cutest kid. Sorry there. Um, the, the, you better show them where they're going to get the value from. Like you need to show them, hey, if you recruit someone to my team, you get 700 bucks and you're going to get this and we have enough leads. So don't worry about it. Most people, when you recruit to a team, agents that have been there are like, oh, there goes my leads. No, you can only have 20 leads max a day anyway, or a month anyway. So you didn't lose anything. So make sure you frame that mindset for your agents that are coming on and get their buy-in for growth. We do tons of education and events. We offer all of our, all of our coaching is open to all agents in our market. What do you think happens? My agents go out, they'll see someone at an open house. They invite them to our coaching. That person signs up. They list them as a sponsor at the company. They then get money. Makes it really freaking simple to recruit. That's how I was able to go from 15 agents to 100 agents in a year. Portrait onboarding, day one, expectations. Day two, they start dialing. If you make your agents think they need to learn too much, they're going to get too scared to start dialing. We make them do 2,000 dials within the first 30 days. We also have Portrait University that I created. So any and every system I've ever made is in this university. If someone that's new on your team asks you a question and you don't have a university built, open up Zoom or Loom or however you want to record it, have the person ask you the question and then answer it to Zoom. Any documentation, save it in a Google folder on Google Drive. And then when you go to build out your university, you have all the content you need. At the end of the 30 days, we make them do an exam. They have to do five practice offers. They have to do five buyer consultations and they have a hundred question exam. The five practice offers and five buyer consultations are done throughout the 30 days. So it's not all at once. We make them send one week one, one week two, three, and then two on the last week. Um, that way we know how these agents are progressing. If they don't get us to us all this stuff in 30 days, then we fire them. So it's a 30 day trial. We're not super strict on it. We're now extending it to maybe 60 days because we're finding it's a lot to do, but one kid finished it in four days. So there is ways to make sure that they're doing whatever you want required done. Um, the biggest thing is it's hard to get an offer, practice offer, review it, tell them what's wrong with it before they write their next one. So that's why we're maybe extending this to 60 days uh, to find out what best works. Like I said, we don't have a perfect system. We're always improving it to make it better. Team finance system, we review everything every single month. 
Um, also making sure that you need to teach your agents to save. You need to teach them, hey, set up your tax accounts right when you join our team because you get $100,000 that's not $100,000 in your pocket. You got to pay taxes. And like I said, California, I think they charge 70 or 80% now. No, it's not that bad, but it's close. Um, when people say Canada have expensive taxes, I think California has got to beat. Uh, but we say all this stuff, get your finances in order because if you're stressed on finances, then your agents aren't performing to their top level. And then they may be doing stuff like writing offers on properties that shouldn't be even selling because we're just trying to sell a house. We want to come from a place of ethics and honesty to help our clients. And the only way you can do that is if your agents have the financial security. When an agent needs a closing, they're not going to do what's best for their client. Hopefully they do. But if they're like dire need, so we focus on finances so much. We want them to have investment properties. We want to make sure that they go through that. Um, so we do financial Fridays as much as we can. I run out of topics to you know talk about. I was on a moped six years ago. So I obviously don't know a ton about money. I've learned a little bit over the years. But bring in guest speakers if you're not the expert. Don't go super high level. Do the base stuff. And as you split up your team and different methods, then you can go higher level on certain things. We can go to the next one. All right, financial foundations. Um, make sure you register your business and your official. You know, separate your businesses. If you've got stuff that's your personal or your business, freaking do a little label on your credit card. Do not use your personal credit card for your CRM or whatever. Use it, one credit card. I knew when I started out, I had to kind of do a couple like, switches here and there because credit cards were getting a little maxed out, but keep your receipts, all that stuff. QuickBooks is fantastic if you're not using a system and then track everything. We go through every single month, we go through every single expense on our QuickBooks and we'll say, hey, what's this one? What's this one? You'd be surprised how many little things slip through or like renewals and you're like, you got to cancel those. Then team leadership systems, uh, getting your team built up. If you're expecting them to be badass, you got to empower them. Make sure that they know if I always have the saying, if you're not effing up, you're not trying. So don't be scared if your team makes mistakes. Um, congratulate them on getting to the process of asking the question. The worst for me is when a person doesn't ask questions about a sale and you're like, you're not really, you know, ask questions, make sure you're doing things and, and make sure you have that build them up and let them know like, Hey, look, at your level, you know, crap ton more than I ever did. Um, help them out and then focus on leadership to develop the talent. You've got to build your people up. If you're saying you're going to do a squad leader for Zillow, offer it to everyone, see who applies and pick the best, the best candidate, you know, conversion, accountability, who works with your core values, then go with it. But don't go and assume that other people don't want to be a part of it. That's how you can build up leadership and build people up. Here's what we do, uh, what we call it. We actually changed the name, Joe. It's not green. We call it foundation now. So when I was telling you about the different leads, uh, or I'm sorry, the different closings, we have this right here basically breaks it up. We change it on a quarterly basis, depending on how difficult the quarter is. Right now, mastery, we have it nine plus. So you can make it however you want. Say you have 10 agents, you can divide up how you want to reward your agents. Some people will do a lot more intense stuff, but it allows them like, you know, yacht party, mastery dinner. One thing that we do, which is amazing. If you've got quite a few agents on your team, start doing birthday parties, maybe every quarter, have your birthday parties at your home. If you've got a house where you can host wherever, um, my house, I have the agent, their spouse, significant other, their family, their, you know, their, their kids, they all come to my house and we'll have about 20 people total. And we're doing that every quarter. That doesn't involve any of the rankings of where they're at as an agent. It involves anyone, and which is great because then, you know, the foundation, which is green on here, get to mingle with the mastery and the mastery get to talk to the core people and it makes it so that everyone can collaborate and they get to meet each other. Because if you do only events in the level that they're in, then they kind of don't have that cross and there's like, oh my gosh, that person, I can't ever talk to them. It helps with culture by doing this. So we do something, you know, we do a picnic every time we do a team outing, we'll pick like. We did, uh, what did we do? The, what's, what's it when, paintballing. So we took our team paintballing, that was a blast. So do things that are gonna like create a memory and maybe something a little bit higher level. One thing I'm thinking about doing is doing, uh, anyone who hits mastery next quarter is surprising them with a the hot air balloon ride and saying we're taking our business to the next height, our new, new heights and taking them on a hot air balloon ride throughout you know wine country here in Southern California. 
So do things that celebrate your team. It definitely helps out, but divide people off based off of meetings. I know that when you're new, you may only have maybe three groups. Don't divide them so that there's only one person in each one. The way I thought of it is like top 25% one, bottom 25% one, and then just cut them up that way. So whatever makes that in your sense for your uh, units. And it's important to look back. So you went over seven critical systems and I really want to, everyone to take note, like this is what was implemented to get, to help get to a hundred million. You're seeing how it got to a hundred million. And then a couple of years later, that same team is going for a billion. And so it's so important and so critical to get your systems dialed in at an earlier stage. That way it's so much easier to scale. Because if you're doing it at an earlier stage, then you can just iterate it and improve it as you go. But I think what Mark's done really well is he didn't wait for anything to be perfect. He actually has his favorite saying that has to do with that. Uh, my done is better than near perfect. Is that what it is? Yeah, my done is better than near perfect and not implemented. There you go. I was close. Um, and so that was all implemented at a very early stage. So then he can improve it as it kind of went. And now you're seeing kind of the end product of what these things turned into. Now we look at SOPs. So we talked about systems, which is all encompassing. And we talk about processes, a small part in a system. So SOPs are your standards of the way you want things done. Okay. And the reason why you create it is because no one can duplicate themselves, but you can duplicate the process you do so that someone else can do them. Okay. And so, and you're going to hear SOPs a lot. And so what I want you to think about is an SOP just includes five main things. Number one is an objective or a purpose. Okay. So everything you're doing, whatever it may be, there's an objective or a purpose to it, right? If you have a recruiting system or how to, you know, attract new agents, the objective is to get one new agent per month. That might be a sample purpose. Number two is an owner. As you get more involved in project management, you know, Mark mentions monday.com. As you start working with an operations team, Everything you have needs to have an owner, someone whose core responsibility it is, because if you don't have that, then it's on you. Number three is instruction. Everything needs to have a distinct way of doing it, that you do it that way, you're able to teach that way, and someone can follow it that way. Number four is frequency. Usually I have people separated out. Is it a daily? Is it a weekly? Is it a monthly, a quarterly, or an as-needed basis? Everything you do should fall into one of those categories. And then number five is completion. What I mean by that is not only did it get done, but how do we know it's done? So when you do something, what's the thing that says I'm completed with it, it's done? Is it a contract signed? Is it a person hired and filling paperwork? Whatever it may be, there needs to be a completion. And so this is what SOPs encompass. Now, when you're organizing them, the easiest way to do it, obviously, is, is Google Doc because it's simple. You can just write everything out. Um, once you kind of go from that and you hire an assistant or you have an assistant, and a marketing person, then something that might work for you is Trello. And so Trello allows you to get everything on boards in front of you. Um, it doesn't allow for a lot of collaboration and communication between people, but it does allow you to set responsibilities and to have a role dialed in. So you can see everything in front of you. So, so you know what they're working on when they're doing it. And then as you move up to three or more people, you want to use something like Asana or monday.com. Mark uses monday.com. I use Asana, which I'm building out. And so that's really good for having multiple people being able to collaborate and having everything dialed in. So you saw all the systems and processes. What this does is it gives that a tech platform to where everything is laid out in front of you and you can see your entire business snapshot on your screen. Anything you wanna to add to that, Mark? No, I think that don't think you need all these programs to be successful. Correct. I had a Google Doc. So just start there. Don't spend your money. Don't waste your money. You can do it on anything simple. And then as you grow, you get more and more. And so here's one last thing I'm going to give you. Um, you know, we've got a couple minutes left. And so it was important for me to kind of show you the I gave you a 30,000 foot view and I'm going to I'm going to keep that saying. But what I'm going to show you is the way that I look at things when I'm working with a team. And the reason why these agents, whether it's a team or whether it's an individual agent, the reason why they're able to double in production is because everything's laid out in front of them. And then 
of course, I'm helping them kind of go through that, but the strategy is dialed in to a T from the start. And I'm gonna show you what that kind of looks like. It might feel a little overwhelming, um, but this is what it looks like. So if you look at the operations of a business, I break, well, whether it's operations or, or sales or any aspect, I break everything down into stages. The reason why is because we teach everything from one level. We teach everything from kind of someone who's right here. And when we're right here, we often try and implement something that's so much higher than where we need to be. And we complicate the entire process. And so what I always focus on is I break everything down into stages and that stage is broken down by volume. And so you can see if I'm just giving you an example, the first two stages are really focused on a solo agent up until 20 million. And when I look at operations and what I recommend you do is everything's broken down into systems, people, data, and money. And that's the way we can take control of operations is the strategy is dialed into a T from the beginning. So you can get a sense of what we're looking at and you'll notice each stage is anywhere between doubling to double and a half in a sense. And so then you get into the team leader stages where the focus is really on systems and data, right? And that's a lot of what we're talking about. As we said, the seven to get up to hundred million, it's because that's really critical in this stage. The systems you wanna get dialed in, the people you wanna have on your team, the data you wanna start collecting and the money you wanna start focusing on, okay? And what this does is by focusing on one stage, it allows you to dial everything in at that stage, do just enough, and then go to the next stage of your business. And that's how we're able to double each and every year or the method methodology I talk about. Then as you grow, you get to the sixth and seventh stage. And so you see the systems, the people, everything changes in each stages, which is why it's so critical. We have so much content out there, but don't think that everything they say has to be implemented because they're saying it at a level or a stage that's different from where you're at. And so it's crucial you focus on where you're at and what you need to do to get to that next level. And so this is kind of a sense of, you know, what goes on in my crazy head. And Mark has a, a variation of what goes on in his head when he's dialing in, like what really needs to happen now and what we can put off. And so I just wanted to give you an idea of everything we're doing and why we're doing it, how it fits into the overall scheme. This is just for operations. 